Nikki Strong, and this is VOA1, The Hits. Welcome to Learning English, a daily 30-minute program from The Voice of America. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Katie Weaver. This program is aimed at English learners. So we speak slowly, and we use words and phrases especially written for people learning English. Today on the podcast, we have a wide range of stories for you. We will go from Africa to Southeast Asia, then look at higher education in the United States. We will close the show with a conversation about the chilly or cold weather some people have been experiencing during the Northern Hemisphere's winter. Gregory Stockel joins us today to tell about the plans Australian mining companies have to start digging for lithium in Thailand. The metal is important for electric vehicles. Then, Jill Robbins and I have this week's higher education report. We look at how a 40-year-old computer commercial made a difference to the field of study known as user experience. After that, Katie has this week's words and their stories. We talk about words and phrases that go along with cold weather expressions. But first, here's Dan Novak with this story about rhinos in Kenya. Kenya began its biggest rhino relocation project earlier this month. Workers began the difficult work of moving 21 of the endangered animals to a new home. They each weigh around one metric ton. A previous attempt at moving rhinos in the East African nation was a disaster in 2018. All 11 of the animals died. The latest project experienced early troubles. A rhino targeted for moving was successfully hit with a tranquilizer shot from a helicopter, but ended up in a creek. Veterinarians and park rangers held the rhino's head above water with a rope to save it, while a tranquilizer reversal drug took effect. It was then released. Wildlife officials have said that the difficult project will take time, likely weeks. The black rhinos are a mix of males and females. They are being moved from three conservation parks to the private Loisaba Conservancy in central Kenya, the Kenya Wildlife Service said. They are being moved because there are too many in the three parks. They need more space to roam and hopefully to breed. Rhinos generally spend time alone and are at their happiest in large territories. Kenya has had some success in saving its black rhino population. In the mid-1980s, the rhino population fell below 300 because of poaching, raising fears that the animals might go extinct in a country famous for its wildlife. Kenya now has nearly 1,000 black rhinos, says the Wildlife Service. That is the third biggest black rhino population in the world, behind South Africa and Namibia. There are just 6,487 wild rhinos left in the world, says rhino conservation group Save the Rhino. All live in Africa. Kenyan officials say they have relocated more than 150 rhinos in the last 10 years or so. Six years ago, Kenya moved 11 rhinos from the capital, Nairobi, to another sanctuary in the south of the country. All died soon after arriving at the sanctuary. Ten of them died from stress, lack of water, and starvation, which was worsened by salt poisoning as they struggled with saltier water in their new home, investigations found. The other rhino was attacked by a lion. 
Some of the 21 rhinos in the latest relocation are from Nairobi National Park. They will make a 300-kilometer trip in the back of a truck to Loisaba. Others will come from parks closer to Loisaba. Loisaba was once home to a healthy black rhino population before they were wiped out in that area 50 years ago, said Loisaba Conservancy CEO Tom Sylvester. Kenyan wildlife officials say the country is aiming to grow its black rhino population to about 2,000. They believe 2,000 would be the best number considering the space available for them in national and private parks. I'm Dan Novak. Thailand hopes to start producing lithium from a mine in its southwest in about two years, government and business officials say. The mine could help the country become a center for electric vehicle, or EV, production. Lithium is a metal critical to EV battery production. Establishing lithium mines would put Thailand in a special position among major producers of the metal because the country is also developing an EV production industry. Chinese car makers already promised to invest $1.44 billion in that industry in Thailand. The Australian company Minor Pan Asia Metals is preparing to register for mining permits in March for the Ryung Kiet project. The project is taking place in the country's Pangya area. The property could also include the proposed Bongai Tom mine. Pan Asia's leader Paul Locke told Reuters that the company is optimistic about starting lithium chemical production from Ryung Kiet by early 2026. Thailand's Department of Primary Industries and Mines, or DPIM, predicts that the Ryung Kiet site could produce about 164,500 tons of the metal. That would be enough to produce at least 1 million EV batteries of 50 kilowatt hours, said DPIM Director General Adidat Vasinonta. The official said mining could begin there in about two years. And Pan-Asia's Paul Locke says the mineral resources at Bong Ai Tom might be 10 to 70 percent larger than Ryung Kiet. Experts do not know how much reachable lithium exists in Thailand. Major suppliers of the metal include Australia, Argentina, Chile, and China. Thailand is Southeast Asia's largest automobile producer and exporter. It wants EVs to account for 30% of its yearly automobile production by 2030. Narit Tertsadira Sukhdi is Secretary General of the Thailand Board of Investment. He said the government has supported 38 battery production projects, including those for EV use, with total investment at $659.4 million. Our goal is to push Thailand to become the regional hub for battery production, both for EV and for energy storage, he said. A regional hub is an important center of activity for a part of the world. 
The Thai government is also pushing for lithium exploration in new areas. That includes changing laws to permit private companies to study agricultural lands, Aditad said. One of the interested companies is Matsa Resources, an Australian miner looking for lithium in Thailand. Matsa holds two special permits to look for lithium in Thailand. And it has over 100 requests waiting, it said in January. They will be only one of a handful of countries that have got the whole supply chain from mining to production within the same country, said Paul Pali, that's as leader. The lithium under exploration in Thailand is found within a mineral known as lapidolite. It is more costly to process than the kind of lithium mined in Australia and Chile. Matsa and Pan Asia said they are in discussions with Chinese companies to process the lapidolite mineral. Chinese companies have experience producing lithium from lapidolite in Jiangxi province. I'm Gregory Stockel. Many people first heard about Apple's Macintosh computer through a television commercial during the American football Super Bowl game in 1984. However, the commercial did not show a computer at all. It showed a woman throwing a hammer at a large screen. On the screen was a man giving a speech. The screen exploded, and an announcer said, Apple Computer will introduce Macintosh, and you'll see why 1984 won't be like 1984. 1984 is George Orwell's book about an authoritarian government, and Apple aimed to tell people that the new computer would be different. It would be easy to use. Many computers at the time only did one or two things, and they required the user to type complex commands to start the programs. Jacob O. Wolbrock is a professor of information at the University of Washington. He wrote about Apple's commercial in the conversation. Apple was selling a product for human beings to use, Wolbrock writes. After the commercial, he suggests, Apple became known for design and the world started paying attention to the idea of user experience or human-computer interaction. The Macintosh um, was one of the first products to really prioritize user experience and focus on making something usable and understandable, learnable, even guessable, so that people didn't have to always read a manual uh, to learn how to use it. Mackenzie Bristow is a former language teacher and researcher who now works in user experience in Atlanta, Georgia. She said Macintosh was one of the first products to think about the user. What is the role of the person? What is the role of the user, she asked. She explained that in design, the rule is first understand the person before thinking about what the product looks like and what it can do. Forty years after the launch of the Macintosh computer, we now see computer screens everywhere at restaurants, at airports, and even in cars. All of these devices have been designed by experts in user experience. Many colleges and universities now offer study programs in user experience. While it is part of STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math, Wolbrock said students from different areas of study, including psychology or communication, 
could be successful. The kind of student that thrives in user experience is a student who has, above all else, a real curiosity about how people interact with technology. And students whose first language is not English can absolutely do well in user experience. One of those students is Kartik Sundaram of India. He studied computer science at the University of Michigan and chose user experience for his graduate study. He finished last year and is now teaching the subject. I never felt like I had a personal desire to pursue computer science, he said. He called the work very isolating. For fun, he took a photography class. While in the class, he met someone who was studying in the user experience research and design program. He told me about how, you know, it's like this blend of design and people and technology. And that kind of kind of lit a fire in my in my heart to say like, okay, this seems a lot more interesting. Let's jump right in. Let's learn more about it and let's apply to that school. Sundaram said user experience is good for people who are personable and good at making connections. Some of those are called soft skills, he said. And the soft skills really matter. While he grew up speaking English, Sundaram said the world of user experience is more and more open to people who are learning English or who may speak with an accent. I don't think it's an expectation that your English is flawless, he said. Bristow said the ability to speak more than one language is kind of a superpower in user experience because those people are comfortable interacting with many different kinds of people. That's really something to be celebrated, she said. Sundaram is teaching, but also looking for work in the field. Wobrock is a professor, and Bristow works on training programs for a large company. They each spoke about the need for user experience professionals to work in the expanding field of artificial intelligence, or AI. Sundaram said, We're not going to be restricted to a text box in ChatGPT for much longer. There are going to be other ways to interact with it. Bristow said, The ability to understand language is important. AI programs will need experts who understand how language changes based on where people live, their level of education, and their age. Wobrock said, user experience professionals are starting to work on projects called human-AI interaction. There will be a great need for user experience professionals to help understand how people and AI can interact and work together in profitable ways, he added. But Sundaram warned that user experience study programs, also known as UX, are becoming very popular. He said some students see UX as a field to make a lot of money with few certification requirements. And... Several companies are letting go of people with experience in the field. Sundaram said, It's definitely a difficult market, but it's an incredible field, and there are new interfaces coming out that need our work. I'm Dan Friedel. And I'm Jill Robbins. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. On this program, we explore words and expressions in the English language. We give definitions, examples, notes on usage, 
and sometimes we use them in short conversations. In a recent science report, we explained about a weather system called the polar vortex. It caused a snowball effect on extreme weather around the world. The event led to record high temperatures in many parts of the world. But much of North America had to deal with extreme cold. Some areas recorded temperatures as low as minus 20 degrees Celsius. In an earlier Words and Their Stories program, we explained how to use the expression snowball effect to describe a situation where one action or event causes many other similar actions or events. Are you thinking that there must be many more English expressions related to snow, ice, and cold weather? You are right. The term snowball effect is just the tip of the iceberg. Or, to put it another way, we have many more expressions in American English related to the cold weather. So, today we will explore some winter words and expressions. In the dead of winter, many people like to skate on frozen lakes. But watch out! You don't want to skate on thin ice. That is dangerous. If it breaks, you could fall into the cold, dark water below. You could even drown. So, the expression skating on thin ice serves as a warning. For example, if a friend is always late to work, you might tell him he is skating on thin ice with his employer. But, you might not want to say anything to your friend. Maybe it is none of your business when your friend arrives at work. So you decide to put your warning on ice. To put something on ice means to suspend action on something, a temporary halt. In fact, today a co-worker asked me to put my project on ice, so I would have time to help her with today's lesson. When we put food on ice, we preserve its quality for a time. We can wait to eat it later and it will still be good. What about when we break the ice, though? That sounds dangerous, right? However, it just means reaching out personally to a stranger. Like in this example. Hi, Matt. Have you met our new teacher, Jennifer? No, not yet. Why don't you break the ice and introduce yourself this afternoon? I certainly will. Ice is not all we might face in winter. Sometimes the snow is so deep we cannot even get out of the house. At those times, you might say, There is a snowball's chance in hell. I'm leaving home today. Hell is fiery and extremely hot. A snowball has no chance at survival there. So the expression describes something that is impossible. Now that we are stuck inside the house, we say we are snowbound or snowed under. And we often use snowed under to describe a situation in which we have too much work to do. American children usually love a snow day. That phrase is used to mean schools are closed. Students might spend the day outdoors, throwing snowballs or building a snowman. Or maybe they stay inside, 
covered up in a warm blanket next to a hot fire, snug as a bug in a rug. We use the expression snug as a bug in a rug to describe a soft, warm, and safe position or situation. Sounds like a great place to be, especially during a snowstorm. I mean, no one wants to be left out in the cold. That can really hurt physically and emotionally. Sometimes we use this phrase, left out in the cold, when someone has rejected or forgotten us. We will never leave English learners out in the cold, to be sure, especially not in the dead of winter. And that's Words and Their Stories. I'm Katie Weaver. I'm Dan Friedel, and you're listening to the Learning English Podcast. We just heard Katie Weaver talk about phrases connected to wintry weather, and now she's here to share some more. Thanks for not giving us the cold shoulder, Katie. Ha ha, Dan. Another popular phrase, the cold shoulder. That means to ignore someone on purpose. And thank you for not icing me out of the podcast chat. In your report, you talked about the term cold snap or a sudden brief spell of cold weather. Isn't it interesting that people never use the term warm snap? You are right. I have never heard snap used that way. I don't know why we don't. Right now in Washington, the weather is unseasonably warm. We are experiencing a sudden brief period of warmth. But we call that a warm spell, not a warm snap. Katie, spell in this case, we should explain for our listeners, means a period of time, nothing to do with using letters to make words. You could also talk about heat by saying a heat wave, but usually that means a number of very warm days in a row. Katie, you must be glad that going outside today does not require a heavy coat. True. I am enjoying this break from sweater weather. And a sweater is a piece of clothing, often made of thick wool or cotton, They help keep you warm when it is cold outside. So, if it's sweater weather, it is chilly. Katie, do you have any favorite sweaters? I do, Dan. My husband's parents brought it back from Ireland as a gift to me. It is a very thick sweater made of pure wool. Pure as the driven snow wool? Dan, you have all the winter expressions out today. But yes, it is 100% wool, pure as the driven snow. Can you explain what the word driven means? I mean, why not just say pure as snow? Good question. I think it is because driven means the snow has just fallen or blown. It is yet untouched by people or animals. It's unmarked. That sounds about right, Katie. Driven by the wind into fluffy piles of snow. Anyway, the snow is all gone in Washington now. I'm going to head out for a walk. And you know what? I'm not even going to wear a coat. Good for you, Katie. You can go sit a spell outside. Listen to the birds and enjoy the city's warm spell. You got it. Thanks for having me on the show, Dan. What a blast. And that's the Learning English Podcast for today. Thanks, Katie, for joining me for that conversation. I hope we don't have too many cold days ahead. And thanks also to all of my VOA colleagues 
who worked on today's program. Most importantly, thank you for listening. For more, visit our website at learningenglish.voanews.com. I'm Katie Weaver. And I'm Dan Friedel.